And Georgina's like, okay. <laughs> That's my lip pouty sound. <laughs> Hey, Maniacs! Welcome to Midsummer Maniacs. I'm Sarah. And I'm Mark. And this is episode 19, Tainted Fruit. Fruit. (laughs) This is also the time when you would say, season five, episode one, but we'll get to that in a second. Yeah, we will. It is season five, episode one, but we'll get to the 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 controversy. Controversy. Uh, just to begin with, Midsummer Maniacs is a podcast dedicated to ITV series Midsummer Murders. Each week, we dig into an episode of the show, including the murders, the mayhem, and the loonies, and everything else we love. We love the loonies. Uh, just a warning at the beginning, if you let your kids watch the show, they should be fine to listen to the podcast, but if the show is too much for them, the podcast probably is also. This episode was filmed in October... And November of 2000, and broadcast April, May 2001, with 9.8 million viewers. So I said it's season five, episode one. Tell us about the controversy. What happened is I trusted Wikipedia, and I realized this was a mistake. Mm. But on Wikipedia, this is actually season four, episode six, which is not the case. And the reason why I say it's not the case and that Wikipedia is wrong, because I asked people on uh, the Facebook and uh, the Twitter and the Instagrams, and I got lots of responses. Mm -hmm. But the best response I got was the ITV website lists this as season five, episode one. They make the show. Yeah. (laughs) So they get to decide. They get to decide. So this is season five, episode one. I checked our box set. Yeah. So before the, you know, advent of Netflix and stuff, we had these on DVD and our box set does include this episode, but it doesn't even break them down into seasons. Oh, okay. It just numbers them from the beginning. So this is episode 19 our, or 20 or something. Because our first box set has a whole <clears throat> bunch of seasons. It has like the first six seasons in yeah. one box set. So it doesn't even tell us that because I thought that would be definitive too. So this is what we're going with. If you want to argue any more with us, feel free. We're not going to change our mind. <laughs> It it's doesn't ITV. Matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't it's matter. the next one. Yep. Right? Did it air real close to season four? The air the air date is in question. Uh, so I don't I couldn't find an exact air date. So. Okay. Well, all right. It's a good one. Yep. It's they're all good. Tainted fruit. This is one that um like several other episodes has inspired lingo around our house. Yes. It's frequent that we say something like they ripen by their own corruption. Whenever ripening or corruption is mentioned, it's usually followed by it. they're ripened by their own corruption. Which in my mind, Barnaby said in an ominous way. But in reality, he goes, huh, they ripen by their own corruption. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So what he's referring to, the yes. tainted fruit in question, yes. are meddlers. Meddlers! M-E-D-L-A-R-S. Different from every episode prior to this. Yes. I would like to propose that this is a very literate episode. Okay. Because there is an overriding metaphor. You have to, okay, here's an aside. I have a PhD in English. PhD. And two master's degrees in literature. One, two. I'm sorry. My brain is infected by this stuff, right? But in this episode, it really jumps out. So if, you're, if you don't know anything about meddlers, which even people in the UK might not be familiar with meddlers, they are a fruit that grows on a tree. They were brought to Britain by the Romans. They were big in, in Rome and even in Greece. And they grow on trees and they look a bit like um, a really dark brown apricot. Yeah, that's what I thought they were when I first saw them in the episode, like apricots. But there's a difference. Yes. On one end... There is a series of, because fruits grow from from flowers, right? Yes. Um, from the interior of a flower after it's pollinated. Uh, so on one end of the fruit, there are five or six kind of petally shapes that kind of flare out from oh, the fruit. Okay. Which led the medieval writers to call them open arses. 
Oh. <laughs> so when Chaucer mentions meddlers, he doesn't even say meddler. He just says it's an open arse. And the audience would have known what Are he was talking sure about. Are we sure that he's not talking about open arses? It, there's also reference, reference to them being ripe and rotten. So oh, okay. it's open for, I guess you could argue it. We should talk to our medievalist friend about open arses. Well, as somebody who can still recite the opening prologue to the Canterbury Tales when I've had a few drinks, I think I qualify okay. to say that he's talking about the fruit. Okay. Shakespeare referenced it many times. He talks about meddlers. Excellent. Because they are this awesome metaphor, right? Okay. And they're a metaphor for a couple of things that are completely relevant to this episode. Okay, lay the metaphors on me. Though I will say, before I lay the metaphors on you, that they are said to taste like apple butter when they're actually ready to eat. Oh, okay. With a little bit of cinnamon and vanilla. And they grow in U.S. zones 5 to 7. So we could grow meddlers here in Indiana if we could keep any plant alive in our yard. Baby, we can't grow wisteria. I know. Maybe we could grow meddlers. Though. It tries to attack. What we need to do is grow a meddler near the wisteria and they can fight. Yes. <laughs> See who could win. Which is more British and who could win. The metaphor thing. So there is this corruption making them sweet, right? And when mm -hmm. it comes to fruit that need frost to ripen, because that's, that's what meddlers do. They stay unripe until they freeze first. And then when the frost hits them, that kind of starts to degrade the interior because it crystallizes and then it thaws. Okay. And it's called bledding. Oh. B-L-E. So you're bledding at your open R's. T-T-E-D. They're bledded, not corrupt. Okay. I don't know. I think you might need to go to the doctor if you're bledded out your corrupt <laughs> open R's. Yeah, I know. I know. But it tastes like apple butter. <laughs> It's so wrong. Anyway, the metaphor thing. Let's get back to that, okay? Yes. All right, because we're going to see this over and over in this episode, and I find it really interesting because I think the writer was doing something really smart. Okay, cool. So there's a, f a few different ways that meddlers are referenced. So yes, they they are rotten and yet sweet, right? So there's this kind of like something that is bad is tempting you. Yes. Okay, so there's that kind of metaphor. Yeah. Then there's an idea that it's the fleetingness of the prime of life. Okay. So you have to get old to get wise and actually be at your best. Oh, I can see that. But then you die. Yeah. Right? So it's, there's Just this, when you get it all going. Yeah. There's this fleeting period of your life where you are at peak. Yeah. And then you're done. So we've got characters who certainly rot. Yep. We've got characters who are tempted by things that are rotten but seemingly sweet. Yes. And we've got characters who are older and in their prime, be it ever so brief. Hmm. The writers here were very smart. So they th use this one metaphor in several different ways. This is David Hoskins who wrote this. He's wrote, written a bunch of these episodes. Uh, he's at home sipping his tea going, finally, somebody <laughs> noticed. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it's clear throughout the whole story, even though meddlers are only mentioned a couple of times, either the ER meddler or the AR meddler, like you're being a meddler or here's a fruit called a meddler. Either way, that metaphor was in his mind the whole time he was writing this. Well, that's fantastic. So we'll that's... see it we'll see it pop up. So I kinda wanted to Prime That's ourselves. great art. I like that. Okay, so let's talk cold opening. Okay, it's a dark and rainy night. I know. Neil's got a graveyard right outside his front door. He does. That's Why? kind of dark and stormy, Especially isn't it? Especially when you're old and sick. I would be like, hmm, I need to move somewhere else. Right, across the, right across the street into the graveyard, it turns out. It right? doesn't have holes in the roof. Now, the nurse Sally Rickworth is there to help him, mm -hmm. which is... Which is nice. And Sherry and Hugo Balcom. Mm-hmm. Okay. And the car drives up and it's Joan Farley. Right? Yeah. Like, like, this is a, we'll see this again and again. Person on deathbed, a bunch of people show up. Right. Right. To either talk to them about wills before they die or to say goodbye before they die. Yep. Now, what I want to talk about it, with this cold open is up to a certain point in this cold opening, it's sad. Mm-hmm. And then the music changes and we get a turn. Mm -hmm. And I love how 
the writing, the acting, and the music all work together here. Because Joan is looking at Neil and we're looking at the back of her head and she's sad. And But then she turns to the camera. So there's a physical turn. And she says, but I know who killed him. But the music changes right yeah. there and it makes it... It, it's chilling. I it's, love how they do that. It's not quite a dun, 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 and but it's that kind of... They hit the commercial. Oh, know, boy. So. Something's gone down here that we don't know anything about. Come back, and Troy and Barnaby are off. One more note. Yeah. I was particularly impressed with the set dressers in Neil's bedroom, and I'm stumped as to how they would have created drips from the ceiling into those bowls during the whole scene. Because you so, see it dripping and you hear it dripping. So they definitely had some kind of rig that yeah. they must have lined up perfectly, moved bowls and buckets directly under wherever they had a leak going to catch it. It's really well done. So I bet you that rig is a PVC pipe with a little bit of water. And a hole in through it. it. And a hole in it. Yeah, it probably is something that's simple. along the top along where the lights are. Yeah. But to have that near near the lights... Well, in the old days, they, they, these are stupid hot lights, too, yeah. right? <laughs> but, it, you know, it's raining outside, which they probably just waited for a night when it was raining to do the outside scenes. Big deal, right? But uh, yes and no. <sighs> there's a lot of rain. It's not a rain rig over yeah. a few people. Rain is really tough because... It, you want rain, you want real rain, but then you have to wait for real rain. Yeah. And waiting is terribly expensive. Right. But if it was just an exterior shot that they could get any time, right? It could be. But, but definitely the, the the drips, I'm sure they used a rake to do Yeah, that. but then once you get inside having the drips, it was... It, it makes it makes it consistent. No, they actually built a house, including... <laughs> and put holes in the put roof. Put holes in the roof. Yeah. Troy and Barnaby, you're off! Yes. Just like the wrapper on the hard candy. <laughs> I'm annoyed by the hard candy. Not because it's there. It's because they do it twice and they don't do it more. <laughs> the first time, Troy's so, driving. Troy wants a red one. And Barnaby offers him one. He's already green. unwrapped it. And Troy says, well, can I have a red one instead? And he does ask nicely. Yep. And Barnaby's like, I've already unwrapped this one. Take it. So later on. We see Troy give him a green one. Yeah, because and Barnaby's kinda, driving. And he kind of looks at the camera and goes, <laughs> but that's it. Yeah. I wanted more hard uh, candy jokes. No, it was nice and subtle. <laughs> and they're off to see Melissa Townsend, who's, who is apparently 22. That actress is not 22. Well, don't forget, though, first we see Hugo on his bike. Yes. Hugo the botanist. And his wife, Sherry, watering her plants. Because they have to be in nearly every scene because they are the village busybodies. They are. They're involved in everything. They are, but they're nice people. They are, but they're everywhere. Do, do you think that actress is 22? I, I, I think she pulls it off. Oh, I don't know. She seems 23-ish to me. <laughs> 23 and a quarter. I, I think she's fine. So she owns the property where the old man died. Because her dad has given it to her to teach her responsibility. Um, and so Melissa Townsend. But before we get to the house, Troy almost kills Freddie. Yes, Freddie. <laughs> so Troy Frederick runs. Frederick Benteen Brown. Frederick Benteen Brown off the road. He's, or Freddie. He's got a compound name, so you know he's important. He has an Ascot and a fast car, so you know he's important. He's got a Porsche. He's got an attitude, so you know he's important. He's at least self-important. And he gets out of that car, and he is going to rip them a new one. Until Barnaby does one of his things. And he's like, oh, you're, you're a police. Well, who can I complain to? How about you just drive more carefully? And what I love, and you know, in the bizarre world that is my brain, I sometimes do things like, I'm going to write a book about leadership based on Barnaby. <laughs> He's not. a great boss. He's, so. He is a great boss. He, show, he doesn't threaten him. No, and he sticks up for Troy until Freddie leaves. That's right. And then he gives Troy the business. Right. He's not rude to Freddie. Nope. He's a matter of fact. So Frederick Benteen Brown is played by Miles Richardson. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, I've never seen him anywhere. This, no. he's like, this is like a one-part bit. Maybe he's a stage actor or whatever. He's tall. His dad is Ian Richardson. That name's familiar. He is the lead in the British version of House of Cards. Yeah. As soon as you see him, you go, that's where he gets his nose. 
Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. He looks a lot like his dad. His dad was also in Dark City. Oh, okay. He's one of the guys in the black leather that controls how the world works. Yeah. If you've ever seen Dark City. Um, he it's almost, a good movie. You he almost looks like, one of, like a Hellraiser character, yeah. almost. But the interesting thing about Miles is that he has a friend... David Seckham, okay. who's a director. Okay. And they must be really close friends because oh. David Seckham is known for making shorts, short films. Okay. And Miles is in every single one of them. They're buddies. A long series of them. Yeah, they're buddies. With very interesting subjects. Oh, okay. Would well, you like to know? Lay it on me. Just the titles. Okay. Proctologist. Proctologist. Proctologist 2. The Bitter End. A Visit to the Chaplain. The Chaplain 2. <laughs> And more. It was the proctologist. And well, at first I saw proctologist two. And I was like, okay, is this artsy and there's no one? Oh, no, there's a one. He's in two movies called proctologist <laughs> that have something to do with balloon animals. I'm not going to go into the details. Excellent. But he's done some really funny work. Like I'm he's sure. very funny. He's not funny in this. Yes. But he's definitely comedic. Okay. That's Miles Richardson. Okay. Or That's Freddie good. Bentine Brown. So they get to the house, and Melissa has received some notes. Blackmail, or no, they're, they're threatening letters, right, with the old cutting the letters out of the newspaper and then gluing them to the page um, composition, mm -hmm. telling her that she's responsible for Neil's death and that she'll be put down just like an animal. Yep, and if Neil dies before the roof is fixed, you'll follow him close behind. But somebody's watching from the bushes. We're never... Ugh. This annoys me. It's got to be the killer because the black gloves are there. Which killer? Georgina. Georgina has no reason to be attacking her at this point in time. I know, but I, uh, I, who is it then? I think it's Joan, but it's stupid that it's Joan, so they dropped it. <laughs> okay, somebody has killer cam there, but isn't a killer? The entire thing is absurd. Absurd. <laughs> you know who's absurd? Melissa. Do you want to slap her or do you want to punch her? There's no other response. Okay. I knew she was annoying in this episode, but having to watch it slowly and take notes, I was like, oh. As a I parent, hate her. as a parent who has never struck a child, I want to hit her for how she treats her dad. That's just bullshit ease for I'm a tightwad. Who gives her an allowance and a. You know, I would gladly take her allowance. Estates to manage, and yeah. she doesn't have a job. She doesn't take anything seriously. <sighs> and it, then just totally rips on her father in front of people. Yeah, it's just right out. Right out. If his father, if her father, has an Italian girlfriend, there's no problem with that. Let him. Maybe he enjoys spending time with her. <laughs> She's so snooty. Archie Townsend, her dad, is played by Terrence Harvey, who you might have recognized because he is the lead protagonist in From Hell. He's Benjamin Kidney. From Hell is the 2001 movie that has Johnny Depp in it. Um, it's about Jack the Ripper. And Benjamin Kidney, the character that he plays, is the, the lead of, like, the police secret agent oh, special that's right. office who's, like, hiding who's actually doing yep. the killings. That's a character not in the comic. But he's yeah. a very bad dude in that movie. Yeah. In this, he's a kind dad who sees exactly who his daughter he's is. He's a little unobservant, and we'll go into that, but... Yes, but he's under no illusion who his daughter is. No, he's not. Right. And he comes when the telephone rings all the way Into from the, the backyard. <laughs> yeah. So we know now where Freddie was going in such a hurry, right? He was off to Sally's to propose to her. Yes. Sally, the, the council nurse, the visiting home health nurse, who is not a killer. No, she's not. <laughs> but she gets framed ten times for Tuesday. She does. <laughs> By <laughs> every, everybody. Everybody wants to frame her. <laughs> and that, so that's, that's one of the turns of the episode, is supposedly this event... The series of events has turned Sally into a conniving person. A series of events, including Melissa having an affair with her husband, yeah. divorcing her husband. Mark, who we never see. No, we don't need to. He's nope. long gone, nope. right? Freddie proposing to her multiple times. All this stuff is, is, and then, of course, all the framing. 
is slowly breaking her down, right? Yeah. From this upright person into this not so upright person. But I'm a midsummer maniac. So this entire scene is about one line to me. And that is? I have to be in Geneva for supper. <laughs> So why? Because it gets under your skin that Europeans can go from one country to another in an afternoon and we can't. Yes, but I'm wondering what time it is. OK. OK, because they go over to see what's her name in the morning, I'm assuming. Melissa. So they met up in the Nick. Though she's got a glass of wine. They met up at the Nick mm -hmm. and then went over to, to Melissa's. Now, she has a glass of wine at her house. So I would assume it's afternoon. So it's afternoon. OK. okay. So then some time has passed. They have a tea. They have, um, they go, Hugo goes by the house and sees the tarp. Things happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's say three o'clock. Okay. If I'm in England, in Oxfordshire at three o'clock, it's probably five or six in Geneva. Okay. Now, Freddie has to get to the airport. Okay. If he doesn't have a helicopter. Even if he has a helicopter, to get to Gatwick or to get to Heathrow, it's probably going to take him an hour. So it's four o'clock now. Unless he has a private airplane somewhere, a private jet. Even then. He's very rich. So then, you okay, let's say he drives 40 minutes to his private airfield. Okay, it's not in town. Malum, by the way, is the name of the town. It's right. said once in the episode. Yeah. So now it's getting seven or eight-ish in Switzerland. He is not going to make supper. <laughs> I don't know. Rich people eat supper really late. I, they eat I, supper at like nine o'clock. I don't care. He's not going to make it there for supper. <laughs> I think it's just something he says to appear important and like a jet setter. I think so. And then he touches he Melissa's bottom. He slaps Melissa on the ass. Which, you know, she didn't ask for that. In front of the woman that you like, just proposed to. I don't like Melissa, but she didn't ask for that. I'm sorry. I support anybody hitting her. <laughs> <laughs> If that makes me a meddler, okay, I'm rotten. That's fine. Melissa tells her not to go to the tennis club do, which yes. means she's definitely going. No, no. Sally tells Melissa not to yeah, go. Yeah, sorry. Sally tells Melissa not to go, which just guarantees that she's going to go. And they have a fight about it. Fine. Fine. Whatever. And then She jo acts 18. Well, she acts 12. Yeah. Right. And then Joan's breaking into the vet to steal the medicine. I remembered at this point that Georgina is the killer. Mm-hmm. Which I was confused at this point because Georgina would have a key to the vet's office. She's married which she to the clearly vet. obviously does because yeah. later on she steals the stuff from the vet's she office. Gets this, she steals the same medications and syringes, right? So I have this note of, why is Georgina breaking into her place in which she probably has a key? Because, Mark, it's not Georgina. It's Joan. That's You're right. You're wrong again. Again. You just remembered it wrong. That's okay. Speaking of snobby people that you want to hit, Georgina and Rafe. Yeah. He's so nice. He's yes. the village vet. He's very kind. He doesn't even take payment from that one man. He shows kindness in that scene. He's genuinely nice. The dog that hates Troy likes Rafe. Yeah. But his wife? Woo. Oh. How could he marry her? I don't understand how he married her. She is so awful. And the only thing that she could good that she does in the entire episode is she helps a little girl learn how to ride a horse. But she gets paid to, and she's only doing it to impress Lord and Lady Hislop. Now, I actually think this is our first aptly named pub. What's it called? The Horseshoes. Oh, that's relevant. They make a reference to it, and she does horse stuff. That's as close as we get. We never see the pub. <laughs> but, but that's what it's called. But I think it may be our first aptly named pub. Now, later on, there's a total trope of how the pub is part of the episode, the name. Mm -hmm. But now I think that's, uh, I think maybe they did it the first time here and then they went, hey, <laughs> let's do that again. Maybe we could connect the name of the pub to the plot. That would be kind of clever. Give that man a meddler. Yep. <laughs> Georgina Canning uh, is played by Eleanor David. The interesting thing that she's done in her past is she played the wife in Pink Floyd's The Wall. Mm -hmm. She played Bob Geldof's wife. He played Pink. Yes, the rock musician. Yeah, and Rafe Canning uh, is played by John McGlynn, who is the second vet's assistant in All Creatures Great and Small. So he's like the second biggest character in 
three seasons of All Creatures Great and Small. I knew I recognized him from somewhere. That's where you know him from. Oh. So it's a tennis do. Uh, social clubs are a bad idea in midsummer. They are very bad. And especially when you can't afford a parking lot. Yeah, what is up with that? These people are so uppity and fancy and self-important, and they park in the grass. Yeah. Not even in gravel, like a pebble gravel, like, nope. a, like a proper house would have. No, nope, it's just park in the grass. Wherever. This do has a character in it that I... I totally don't know why he's there. Derek the pig farmer? Derek the pig farmer. He's does there not... to be Adam's pawn. He is. And, he, and it shows characterization of Adam. Mm-hmm. And it shows characterization of Georgina. But... That's his purpose. I, I almost would have rather had a scene where Joan was saying, well, I was up at Melissa's house today in the bushes creeping around with black gloves on. <laughs> Rather than Derek. But I think it shows that Adam will pretty much get up to anything if it causes trouble, because he enjoys it. Even he, something as crazy as convincing Derek that Georgina is interested in he him. He totally gets off on manipulating people. Absolutely. He's played by Adrian Rollins, who Derek is... Derek is? Uh, sorry, Adam is. Adam is, okay. Who's also in uh, Echoes of the Dead in 2011. He's yeah. in another Midsummer. Um, he's probably best known because he plays James Potter in the Harry Potter movies. Yes. He's he Harry's does. dad. He's Harry's dad. Yeah. And his picture in IMDb is quite rugged and good looking. Yes. And Liz, his wife, who's also there at the party. Who at first I was like, is that his wife or his girlfriend or his sister? I couldn't remember their relationship. And for a while you don't know. And then it's like, oh yeah, it's his wife. Especially because when he sees Melissa, he kisses her on the lips. Yeah. Which makes you think, wait, wait a minute. I thought that he was married to that lady. And anyway, uh-huh. but then you come to understand that that's just, that these people are creeps to each other, right? Yes. So um, Liz Keen is played by Sarah Mare Thomas mm-hmm. and she's been in lots of stuff. But the one that really got me <laughs> is she was in this show from 83 to 85 called Behind the Bike Sheds. Behind the bike sheds. Yes. This is the beginning of a joke. Oh, boy. It gets interesting. It's this kind of slapstick teenage kids show about a bunch of misfit kids at at a private school that are always acting goofy. It's kind of like Saved by the Bell. Okay. Okay. But UK. Yes. But the character she plays is called Trolley Molly. Trolley Molly. She's a lunch lady. Okay. Okay. Who always pushes a cart around. Okay. But the weirdest thing about the show that relates to her character is that in the boiler room of this school, there is a former student named Fanshawe. Okay. Who was damaged by radioactivity. Okay. From the food. Okay. (laughs) He's played by a puppet (laughs) that is hideous. Okay. There, there will be pictures oh, of the show. No, notes. wait a minute. It, it gets better. Okay. He lives in the boiler room because he's so hideous now, and he doesn't age because he's so radioactively damaged, and he spends his time worshiping a school lunch. <laughs> I cannot make this stuff up. So Melissa shows up, and everything stops. Oh, because it's a show as soon yeah. as she walks in, right? Which is exactly what she wants. Yes. So she orders white wine, uh, red wine, which first of all, the red wine in those glasses. No, it's a little too transparent. It's way too transparent. It's, right? It may be a rosé at most. Yeah. And Joan just juice. throws it on her dress. Now, I don't like Melissa. No. I'm not ready to the, get to the point of hitting her, but I don't like Melissa. But I think she handles this well. She does the best thing she could do. Yeah, she takes she it off, which shocks everybody. Demands. Throws it at Joan. it. And says, have it laundered. Yes. And then and, walks out. And takes Adam's jacket. Adam's and leaves. magical jacket. Hey, it hides her slip. Did you know Adam had a magical jacket? No. It's because magical? It only covers her butt here. But by the time she gets to Sally's house, when she's drunk with Georgina, mm-hmm. it, it's down to the ground. Oh, it becomes a trench coat? Yes. Impressive. It is impressive. I didn't notice that. And that's the other thing that I like about Melissa is she does go to Sally's house to probably apologize. And and tries to save her from being framed by Georgina. Now, then she uses it as blackmail. True. 
almost there, but she's she's rotten. She's rotten. She's not rotten. She's rotten. Yeah. <laughs> She's fully blooded. Sherry and Hugo are in their chairs and they hear the accident. Is it wrong that I saw them and I thought, that's us. <laughs> Sitting in their chairs. Oh my God. I'm not Hugo. Oh my. <laughs> I can't be Hugo. I'm not ready to be Hugo yet. We get Killer Cam with a syringe. Syringe Killer Cam. And Sally is passed out in her car. Now, hold on. Okay. Mm-hmm. Let's go through this. Who is holding that syringe? The killer. Who is? Georgina. Georgina. Okay. Yeah. But she's, again, not being blackmailed yet. This is, then, this is Joan filling the syringe and then changing her mind. So Joan broke in, filled the syringe, cased the house, and then stopped. Yeah. Then changes her mind and then buries everything in the yard. Yeah. See, I have a problem with that. It I just, don't. It just, She's very upset. It's it's I, a red it's a red I, herring. I don't have a problem with her character being stopping and doing that. I have a problem with us not knowing who this is here. And the the writers and the creators of the show trying to make us think it's somebody else. Because it's a trope yeah. in Midsummer that the killer cam is the killer. Yeah. It's always the killer. It's never a trick. Yeah, but here, here it is. We've got two times we've got killer cam when it's not actually the killer. I love Sally's car. Sally's hanging out of that car. It's so cute. It's a Citroen CV. Yep. And they're There's adorable. Two little, two little things, chevrons on the front. Yep. It's an adorable little car. You can't get them here, though. Hugo says you're in an accident, and the postman just gives up Sally Rickwork. <laughs> I'm the postman. By the way, Sally's like... Radars down there. Yeah, if your car's been damaged, you should probably talk to Sally. That's uh, that's the postman, Rage, played by Richard Clothier. He's also in Vixen's Run in 06, yes. where he actually has a name. Yes, he's he's more much more important. In he becomes Vixen an actual Run. character and not I, just a pointer. I think it's one of these things where they try him out and he shows up and yeah. he's good. He does a good job ratting out Sally, so they think they can put him in another episode. Yeah. <laughs> but the constable... Who puts the breathalyzer in Sally's mouth and actually talks to her? No credit. <laughs> I, I, I am the patron saint of the people who don't get credited in this it's show. It's just not fair. It isn't. Of course, Adam, being the nosy Parker that he is, is driving by, sees Sally being breathalyzed and arrested. And what does he do? Immediately jets off to Georgina and Rafe's writing school. So just so he can just tell people. But... Who gives him all the information? Gwen, who's no. in two scenes, and all she does is gossip. She fills in the blanks. That's she, that's what she does. Sure, her name should be Exposition Jen. <laughs> Gwen. Gwen. Exposition Gwen. <laughs> well, she does a good job. She does, but it's that kind of character who leans in and goes, and she's the killer. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and here's a random piece of information. Well, see, Cully's not in these episodes. That's true. So we need somebody to just Cully? happen to know Cully something who? useful. Cully Barnaby? That person doesn't exist anymore. Georgina is talking to Lord and Lady Hislop and teaching their daughter to ride. I got curious about Lord Hislop. Okay. Because it sounded like a familiar name. So mm. I looked up to see if there was really a Lord Hislop. Yes. Uh, there there was. Okay. But the lad... the Was he a puppet in the basement, too? No, he was not a radioactive puppet. But the last Lord Hislop did die in 1843 uh, under a bit of um, uh -oh. scandal. Scandal? Yeah. There's a reason why that title kind of stopped. What happened? Um, Some embezzling and the murder of 300 people who were kind of prisoners. Oops. Yeah. Oh, well. No. <laughs> It's British aristocracy in the 19th, section, 19th century. Yeah. If they weren't causing problems at home, they were causing problems in the colony. Right. But it was nice that the, the writers could grab a hold of a name that would sound realistic, but not offend anybody. So Georgina has no moral compass here. She's like, oh, poor Sally. And then Lady Hislop's like, I hate drunk drivers. And Georgina's like, I hate drunk drivers too. That, that's what I meant. I meant that, yeah, that's bad. Let me purse my lips. <laughs> I wish you could see, hear the puckering. <laughs> Please ensure 
this cabinet is locked. Well, the door's off, so that might be a problem. <laughs> in the vet's office? Yes. Yeah. Well, never mind. Cujo's in the waiting room. Dogs hate Troy. He's got a taste for coppers. There's a side door. Yeah. They go in and out it looking at the boot print, and yet they make Troy come through the front door. Just to go by the dog. Just so Cujo can try to attack him, and we can see that Rafe can call him any animal. Now, they do some editing here that I don't like because it's it's obvious. The dog's sound comes when the dog is off screen. Yeah. Right? Well, that's what you got to do. They don't dogs have a big, are hard to work with. They don't have a big animal handler budget. Yeah. They get to check out the boot print. Ooh, boot print. Call the crime scene guys and get a cast. If only we had a fax machine. <laughs> they have a special fax just for boot prints. Boot fax. Boot fax. Archie is learning Italian while his daughter is killed. Yeah. And he's saying... La Bella Ragazza, which means the beautiful girl. Ah, okay. I didn't know what he said in Italian here. This is, she doesn't die here. This is where the phone rings. Now, his phone is interesting. A couple of things. First, everybody in this episode has landlines in the first half and cell phones in the second half. Yes, except Adam. Yes. He has a cell phone in the first half. Also, he has his phone hooked up that it rings a bell outside. Mm-hmm. That's weird. I think it's smart. He oh, could, I think he it's could smart just get too. a cordless phone. They he does do have exist. A cordless phone. It is a cordless phone. <laughs> I think it's clever. Back but of course, in the days when we had cordless phones, he cares enough to make sure that he's got an extra ringer for his phone. Yeah. But not enough to make sure that he can hear his daughter dying on the other side of a wall. No. So Joan admits to throwing the wine. She's taking care of her invalid husband, Clive. Now, this is obviously to make Joan sympathetic, Mm -hmm. but me, Clive has the easiest acting job ever. See, I think his job's really difficult. No, I don't think so at all. He has to sit kind of still, not completely still. He's not corpse acting, right? No. He has to make his mouth droop on one side. He's had a stroke, but he can't overdo it and make it funny. Okay. It's subtle. And it's consistent. Every time you see him, he looks exactly the same. Midsummer people, I'm talking to you. If you need somebody to do this, I'll do this. If you're paying? <laughs> yeah. If it's a paying gig, you'll pretend to have had a stroke? No, even if they put me on the show, I'll get over there. I couldn't find a uh, credit for Clive either, could you? No, Clive has no credit either. Maybe he's consistent because they just went to a nursing home and grabbed somebody. No. <sighs> Is that one of those comments no, you're going to edit I think out? Clive <laughs> is fine. No, no. He's convincing and consistent, okay? That's all I'm saying. And Joan is a saint. Absolutely. Take, she can't leave him alone. She's taking care of him. She clearly still loves him. And she loves other people. She's not related to Neil. No. And yet her heart no, is no, broken. Well, 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 she says later on. He's that my he's, family. He's my family. Because that's how she thinks of all the people that she cares about. Okay. Right? We're still unsure why these people care about Neil. He might be a nice guy. Uh, no, he was an old bastard. He wouldn't let anybody in the house, remember? Oh, that's right. Not even repairmen. Whatever. Maybe he was nice to her. Maybe Melissa's right. <laughs> Maybe Melissa purposely left. Now him she's die. got a vacancy. Now you you have this picture of Melissa, you know, spelunking down the side of the house, drilling holes in the roof. Get pneumonia, Neil. I hate you. Hate you. So syringe cam is back. Yes. Now this is genuine killer cam, not fakey fake killer cam. So we see syringe. We see it back up from the gate. Even though her father is learning Italian, he's got his headphones on. He would clearly orient to the movement. He's looking at his book, too, and he walks around, turns his back. I'm sorry, he would see her. What I don't understand is why Georgina dresses in all black to kill somebody during the day. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Stealthy ninja outfit that would call her out anywhere. Like if somebody was looking like heavy coat when Melissa's there in a bikini, it's clearly warm. Okay, so Georgina also has a magic ability, mm-hmm. which is creep, because... Anyone would hear you creeping up on them. She has super stealth? Yeah. She's, I think she, Melissa's supposed to be dozing. Even if she is dozing, she still has a whole bottle, a whole jug of orange juice to drink. I think she would sense a shadow over her. I'm a midsummer maniac. This is a theme running in the show. You don't have to justify your craziness. It's okay with us. The orange juice. <laughs> 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 Which is on a tray at her feet in the grass no, if you're no, no. normal and you didn't notice it. No, no, no. It's past her feet. On there the is no way that she could sit up in that chaise lounge and reach the orange juice. 
she would have to get up. Now, it's on the ground. Would so you- she purposely, because there is no help in this house. No. She purposely put it on the ground out of reach. That's why she hasn't drank any of it. Then why did she bring it out? <laughs> She's too lazy to reach for it. So, you know. Second of all, I'm going to say this. Her bikini top looks like a bra, not a bikini top. I think it does. No, it's got like cup things. Yeah, that's because she's kind of flat chested and it's supposed to make her look like she has boobs. Okay. That's what they do. Anyway, she's got a liver liver full of phenobarbital or whatever it is now. Full syringe. She does a good job falling over her chaise lounge. She does an awesome fall. Her legs go all akimbo. Her legs go all akimbo. And later on, she does a great dead body with those legs akimbo. And I was like, dead body acting right there. And then Adam comes along. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's that's unfair, right? Because uh, Lucy Punch, who plays Melissa, really deserves great dead body acting here. Unfortunately, she's in an episode where Adam dies. Yeah. It's just, it's just, it's not fair to her, but it's, that's the way it is. She does a great job. And, and we've seen that actress in lots of other things. Yeah. She's in Hexed and... Vexed. Vexed. Yeah. She's and, also in a lot of Doc Martens, too. Yeah. And she's, yeah. she's a great actress. Mm-hmm. But, and she does a great fall there. And it's clearly her. And she doesn't break her own neck. She's falling on soft grass and orange juice. Yeah. The WI does flower arranging and it doesn't matter. On to the next scene. Yep, so she's dead. Anyway. The tennis players <laughs> arrive. <laughs> well, we do get Gwen wheeling in from the side. By the way, I know some stuff. And then wheeling back out again, right? <laughs> and Adam, Adam is just so horrible. By the way, I'm going to mention swinger parties. Yeah. Like, and let me see if I can get Georgina and Derek together. Wouldn't that be funny to watch? Ha, ha, ha. In front of Rafe, who, is like... Georgina's uh, husband. It's just... And they're at Melissa's house to play tennis with her, and they just start playing without her. Like, oh, she'll come along, whatever. Yeah. Which kind of shows you what kind of person she is and what kind of friends they are. So now the father is asleep. Yes. But his headphones are off, okay? How big is this estate? Because the sirens would have woken me up. Yeah. And wouldn't a constable have ended, have searched for him? the place, right? No, I mean, like, George is already there. They've yeah. secured the scene and are doing tests and stuff Would before he wakes up. Would the tennis players not have gone and woken him like, up? Like, where's her dad? We got to go tell him. Yeah. Well, they're self-centered gets. Maybe yeah. Rafe would have, but the rest of them, I'm not surprised. Sally arrives in pure midsummer lady freakout. And we're supposed to believe she's upset because she and Melissa have slept together. And I just don't buy it. I can go this far. I believe the actress playing Melissa and the actress playing Sally were in robes on a bed together and had a picture taken of them. Yeah. That is as far as I can believe that. Yeah. And in fact, you can see the camera in the picture. So they may have done this on their own. (laughs) Are these people arranging flowers for their own homes or are they doing church arrangements? No, they're just throwing flowers on the floor because they got to sweep them up. That's true, (laughs) yeah. I hate you, flowers. (laughs) Poor Gwen. She just has to push a broom and gossip, right? But this is where we find out from Sherry that Melissa had an affair with Sally's husband. And Sally's yeah. husband, and they got a divorce. Yeah. Melissa breaks up marriages. Yeah. She's trouble. She was trouble. Meanwhile, Rafe is cooking. He's a pretty good cook. He's serious. He knows how to cut vegetables properly. Yeah. And knows how to tell off his wife. Because he's taken Sally home with him because Sally is upset and he doesn't want her to be alone. She's, you know, unconsolable. But then Georgina comes home and she's like, what's the commoner doing in our house? Let me pout my lips. (laughs) And Sally's like, well, if you don't want me here, I'm out of here. And Georgina's like, okay. (laughs) That's my lip pouty sound. (laughs) Meanwhile, Adam has some visitors. I don't know where Adam spent all of his money. It's not on Hair Club for Men. Oh, you're cold. Because you've got a big old full head of hair that has to be cut every couple of weeks. Just saying. Just saying. And Liz is clearly informed about the debt. This is not a surprise to her. Maybe the depth of the debt is kind of a surprise. She didn't know how far in they were. But the fact that collection agents or bailiffs are coming to the door is not a surprise to her. Right. Yeah. What is what should be it, it, it shouldn't be a surprise to her because the car that he has seen driving throughout the whole episode, that beautiful silver convertible. Yeah. Is an Aston Martin Volante. 
Okay. It is a $150,000 car. Well, he runs a car dealership, so we learned from Fargo that all those people are crooked. But I would think selling that car would get them out of quite a bit of debt. I don't think he owns that car. But he says it's already sold. Yeah, I think he was borrowing it from the dealership. That would explain it. Yeah. Because otherwise, just sell that damn car. How yeah. much debt can you have? Apparently, it's quite a bit of debt. Hmm. But now Joyce has meddlers. Now we get the fruit for the first time. Joyce! Right? <laughs> Tom has a home life. Apparently. For the first time in the episode. It's in the book. I checked. Joyce is going to make and some jam. Barnaby checks the book. Yeah. <laughs> Because it's like he doesn't believe her. No. Nope. He's like, oh, these are kind of off, aren't they? She's yeah, like, oh, no, they have to be overly ripe to be edible. It's in the book. And then he goes, he's, it's weird here. And this is why I think the writer absolutely was doing what you said he did. Because he goes, I wonder if they mean someone who meddles or the fruit. Oh, you banana. <laughs> I'm sorry. I've never called anybody a fruit. Oh, you kumquat. <laughs> I just wonder why Joyce asked Tom to get Sherry's apple jelly recipe and then made meddler jelly instead. Uh, I got to think that that's a, that's, that's, um, the technical term, term for that is a mistake. <laughs> you think so? Yes. <laughs> you think she, he was supposed to ask for a meddler jelly recipe? Yes. I, I could agree with that, but I could also see that um, Joyce would suddenly decide, you know, if I make apple jelly, it might end up good. So I'll make meddler jelly instead. And every time we see Sherry in the house, she's doing stuff with jam. Oh, there's a big push to fill all these jars with jam, jelly. Jam, jam, jam. Jam, 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 everywhere jam. I don't think I would um, trust anything that Joyce canned considering all the botulism and everything else that you can get from things that are improperly canned. If she yeah. can't like make a shank of lamb without making it gross. I don't trust her with jam. Yeah. So we find out Adam has even more bills and he spent all of Liz's money, including her granny's money. It's just rude. At that point in time, I may suggest that Adam needs to see the door. That's not going to solve her problem. She's still broke too. I realize that. But he's got a, he's got a solution that's going to get him out of all of this. Now, I think this whole lesbian subplot was added in the last minute, right? So the picture of she finds is of them, right? But the whole idea is we're supposed to mistake in it for Sally that Sally is is uh, black being blackmailed by Adam. Mm -hmm. It's another frame up job by the writers. Yeah, on Sally, right? And the whole discussion with Troy and Barnaby about maybe she likes the bread buttered on both sides. The only reason you butter your bread on both sides is if you're making, like... French toast. French toast or toads in the hole or something. <laughs> the implication of bisexuality, I don't like. And then Troy Barnaby is like, is so 2000. He's like, but he has a boy, she has a boyfriend. <laughs> so it, clearly... Freddie is not her boyfriend. Clearly she can't be gay. My problem anyway, with that subplot... I think the whole subplot is tacked on. ...is that there's absolutely no indication in Melissa and Sally's interactions with one another at all. Except for Sally's distraught that her friend is dead. Her friend's Which dead. she would be. Yeah. They don't have to have slept together for her to be upset. And as we see with the potted plants, Sally has a tendency to overreact to things. Well, it's not fair. Yeah. It's not nice. But She's upset. The the only reason why I accept that subplot, that blackmail subplot, or red herring of a blackmail subplot, is that it just shows that Sally has been manipulated and used beyond even any level that she knew. From the very beginning. Because Melissa Sally was told never Georgi her friend. We're supposed to imply that, Sa that Melissa told Georgina that she was scheming and did this. Mm-hmm. And I, I just don't like that at all. You think Georgina made it up? No, no. I think that it's it just doesn't need to be there. Oh, I think I think it's just the final stab in yeah. Sally that fully blitz her. So she's a rotten. I guess. Oh, killer cam. Saw a killer cam. I have a problem. So, this shed is more organized than my garage, by the, the way. This shed. <laughs> right? We go over the first saw. The first saw's broken. We go over... 
a workbench. Mm -hmm. We see a chainsaw. We see some gloves. And then we see the handsaw. Mm -hmm. Then we learn later, the next scene, the cut after this, is the saw being used in the old barn. Right. These are two separate locations. Right. And we are given no indication of change of location here. I'm okay with that. I thought it was the same place. What what I'm not okay with is the assumption that Georgina's uppity butt would know that a branch saw wouldn't work to cut a floorboard. Yeah, she had no she would have no <laughs> She wouldn't know. Freaking clue. In reality, she would grab a saw, secret it away in the car, drive out to the barn, go, shit, it won't cut the board. Put it back in the car, drive back home, put that saw away, grab a different saw, put it in the car, drive out to the barn, crap, wrong saw again, go back. The the whole (laughs) idea is that she kills Rafe because he sees her taking the saw. So she's crappy at it, too. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, it's kind of hard to hide a saw. This is a great dead body acting that Adam does in this when oh, he eventually dies. Oh, the way dies. he dies is so and, and we'll get bad. To that. But there is another problem with this, and we'll get to it. There's a problem with that death. So Sally's house, they come and talk to her again. She doesn't want to cramp Georgina's style. They go over everything. She can't find her boots. Oh, Troy. Oh, he does something so bad at Sally's house. Oh. She makes tea. Yep. She brings the sugar bowl in. It has a spoon in it for the sugar. Troy spoons sugar into his cup, stirs his tea with the sugar spoon, and then puts it back in the bowl. The only thing... I would just kick him out of my house. Just get out. Get out. The only thing worse is if he stirred his tea with it. Put put it in his his mouth. mouth. (laughs) And then put it back in the sugar bowl. He's an uncouth beast. He's a, Get out. She's a wee uncouth beastie. Jeez. Just breaking the rules all over the place. We get shoe facts. Yeah. <laughs> it's, <laughs> a, <laughs> it's a Wellington boot, 259 millimeters in length, size 37. Okay, in UK sizes, I wear a 42. Okay. Which is a 10. So they say it's a small. In the UK. So that is a tiny wee foot. It's an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, and it doesn't even go, you know, two thirds of the way up the paper. So well, it is a tiny foot. They must have tiny feet in England because written clearly in the margin is female average. <laughs> well, this now becomes a Cinderella game. Yes. Who in the village has the tiny feet? Yes. Th- and then we're going to take the glass Wellington around and... Put in. Why they even look at a man's boot, I don't know. Because it's gigantic. Like Rafe, I'm, I'm thinking Rafe is going to have giant man boots. Even Adam is petite, and the boots at their house... Giant. Are giant. They're Wellingtons. They're yep. big, right? Who has this wee foot? Sally and Georgina, who strangely have exactly the same size feet. Tiny. they're very different women. Mysteriously tiny feet. Maybe yeah. they had their feet bound as children. Adam arrives in his fancy car at the barn. Now, he calls somebody at first to make sure they're home. The idea Meaning he, that they're not at the barn yes, to attack him to attack. so he can go and get the blackmail money without being attacked. Adam has a mobile phone. He has one the whole time. And Liz gets into his roll-top desk and finds the picture of Melissa and Sally. She has to break into his desk with a letter opener. Now, okay. That's not okay. Not, not, it's not that it's not okay that she broke into it. It's not okay that your spouse has a desk that's locked from you. And has pictures of two of your friends supposedly Cuddling up. Yes. (laughs) There's a lot wrong with that desk. Liz is a very tolerant woman. She takes a lot. Sally's boots are gone. They were supposed to be in the trunk of her car, which makes complete sense for a regional nurse that she would need some Wellingtons in case she's at a farm or something like that, but they're not there. And then Tom and Troy are in Sally's house, and Liz comes and bangs on the door. Bang, 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 because she's looking for Adam. She sees Tom and Troy are there, and she's like, never mind. (laughs) So, (laughs) la, la, la. In my mind, this is now the episode of The Village of Bad Door Behavior. That's consistent in all. Almost every midsummer. The right? bailiffs. If are you're bad having at sex, the leave the front door open. The bailiffs are bad at the door. The bailiffs are bad at the door. Sally throws the plants at the door, 
And Liz knocks on the door as if she's trying to knock through it. Because <laughs> she's desperately looking for her husband. She probably assumes that he's got debt collectors who would hurt him. So Freddie and Georgina have a stupid little scene, and I am obsessed with Freddie's canine teeth because they are not where they should be. <laughs> his bottom canines are way out in front of his other teeth. He's got, like, bottom fangs, right? I'm like, dude, you should get that fixed. <laughs> if you're, like, some Richie Fancy guy, but, you know, what? they just don't do that in the U.K. I, I guess. You would never in the U.S., And maybe it's just because we're so vain. It's just different values. In the U.S., if you were as wealthy as he is supposed to be, your teeth would be not only be straight, they would be veneered. They would be so pearly white that they would blind people when you smiled. So along with the barn being confusing as to what barn we're in, Mm -hmm. the saw barn or the not saw barn, there's a couple, if you're not watching closely here, it looks like Troy and Barnaby kind of go to a round of houses over and over and over again on it's the It's like same the longest day. day and yeah. it's not it's the not. same day. They do change clothes, but there's no sense of the next day. Yeah, there's no later that night, the and, next morning. And to me, that's a problem with editing. They don't really show passage of time, except for the wine glasses at the tennis do. You know what else is a problem with editing? That Georgina supposedly trains horses, but owns no Wellington boots. None at all. She is so snobby that she doesn't even have to rake out horse stalls. Yep. She's that fancy. She is indeed that fancy. So Rafe's driving along and he sees that, uh, no, Hugo's driving along. He sees Jones burying something in the backyard. Joan, why did you not do this at night? Or at least in the backyard, not on the side yard. Yeah, where everybody can see. And Hugo uses a word here. Mem Sahib. Yes. Which means a married, white, or upper-class woman. Who is often used as a respectful form of address by non-whites. Well, they were in India. They've been all over the world because he's a botanist. So it's it's a nice little word that he uses. So it's a very colonial term of endearment. Yeah. He goes home and tells Sherry everything. And though you characterized me as Hugo before... I may have said bizarre uh, machinations of this village in my real life. (laughs) (laughs) You've used that in conversations? Maybe. Liz wanted children. They couldn't have any, right? Well, she knows Adam is dead because she can feel it. Hugo is out looking at orchids. Well, he's already delivered his jam jars and sussed out Jones lying. So why not? And he goes inside and he's upset right away. Okay, this barn where Adam gets killed is the most isolated, easy to see, hey, something's going on down there barn ever. So this is a farming thing. Okay. There's nothing around it. So if you wanted a secret drop-off place, it's just too obvious. It Wouldn't is, you pick someplace else? It's a good place for a barn. Yeah. A bad place for... A secret... A secret drop-off. They, yeah. See, they have barns like that out in the middle of nowhere because you put all the hay in it to feed the animals that are out there. Right? It makes sense that the barn is there. It doesn't make sense as a choice for some clandestine behavior. No. Everybody can see it. But it makes it easy for Hugo to see... Adam's very fancy car down there where it doesn't belong. And we initially don't even see Adam. We just hear flies really loud. And you know it's bad. Oh, it is bad. He's been dead there overnight. Yeah. So, oof. Oof. So Adam is upside down dead. Mm -hmm. There is no way the actor could have held himself in place here. No. They had to have had him, like, rigged, hung up somehow. Yeah. And he is a goddamn trooper. (laughs) Adam does the best dead body situation. Not only is he upside down, feet in the air, over a plow, but he's got a prosthetic on his forehead that makes it look like the plow blade has come clear through his head, out the front, almost slicing his head in half. He, He is a trooper. And... It's well done. It's really, the blood's super, super dark, which it would be if he was there overnight. The only way he could be a better dead body actor is if he was naked. (laughs) That would make that scene so much worse. (laughs) But what I like... Especially when he's hanging by one hand. If he was naked... Oh, 
no, 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 no. The, the thing that I love about his dead body acting is his foot. His foot is in the scene for quite a while. And it's perfectly still. It's perfectly still. And it's a pan such shot, a, so you know it's not like a prop foot. It's his foot. It is his foot. He does such a good job. And George, I love George. He's not in the episodes for very long, but when he's there, he just, he's this little ray of sunshine because yeah. he can't help but be delighted by the strangeness, yes. you know, like... <laughs> He's like, what do we have this time? Ooh, a plow. Wow, death must have been instantaneous because he's nearly cut in half, you know? Like, (laughs) this is much more interesting than those bodies in those, you know, crop circles, though they were interesting, too. This is fascinating. And they they talk to Hugo outside, and then they have this weird conversation because they suggest that maybe they were meeting there for a tryst. Clearly, those floorboards were cut. Yes, but that doesn't mean that they weren't meeting there for a tryst, but being set up to die. And then Troy goes, straw's overrated. It's prickly. Yeah. (laughs) What barns have you been in, Troy? And Barnaby's like, I don't want to know, okay? I don't want to know. So Liz might have killed them, so they go back and talk to Liz. And she gives one of the great lines of the episode, and she must have had to practice this. The legions of debtors cuck- cuckolded husbands and cheated lovers. Yeah. That's a great line. That's the situation that she's in. Yeah. I've been a fool. She gives up the picture, and now Tom has his cell phone. He didn't want to use it before. I guess not. You're so critical. I guess. Let's go see Rafe behind the slowest moving vehicle Ever. (laughs) Well, Tom calls Rafe, who answers, and he says, you're at home. Stay there. I'm on my way. I'm coming over right now. He's worried because Rafe had talked to Hugo and took off. Right. So clearly something that Hugo said set Rafe off. So Rafe Rafe runs home. Rafe run. Rafe Rafe run. Rafe run. Rafe run. Say that too many times, it gets kind of weird. Rafe runs home and answers the phone when Tom calls. But then in between hanging up and Tom getting there, he's like... Sudden tennis. I think I'll go out and play some tennis. Yeah. Because I'm kind of worried that I sort of know who the killer is and it might be my wife. No, he knows who the killer is. And the cops are coming over to talk to me. Tennis. So I'll go play tennis. Yep. Georgina goes out and cuts him open with the syringe. Well, she slashes at him. Yeah, it's weird. That's not how you deal with the syringe. No, but he's a big guy, and he's in fairly good shape. Maybe. And, you know, if she couldn't sneak up on him and just stab him with it and inject him, she might have had to do... But you could see her. She injects him. He's dead. She rushes back to the house and lies in the most uncomfortable sleeping position you could ever find. Meanwhile, Troy Barnaby's like, Georgia! 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 <laughs> she's, she's laying in such a weird way in her blue silk pajamas that oh, go all the way up to her ears. It's just wrong. That we think she might be dead because who would lay that way? But she's just sleeping. And when they wake her up, she's like, oh, I'm sorry, I was... Pretend sleeping. Why are I you didn't, here? I didn't just kill my husband. I didn't pretend hear you. Yeah. It's it's so fakey fake. The cops find all the stuff in Joan's hole. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite the way to put it. <laughs> That's what they do. <laughs> Poor Joan. <laughs> they find boots and a cardboard box with drugs and syringes in it. Yeah. <laughs> And there's an interrogation. She says, I was going to kill her. And I sent the notes. And I creeped by her house. And I did syringe cam one. But I didn't kill her. I changed my mind. I couldn't do it. Because Joan fundamentally is a good person. That's why she's upset at Melissa. So yeah. why would she stoop to that level? You don't really look innocent, Joan. No, she doesn't. No, she doesn't. But she is. And she has an alibi anyway. Because Sherry says that Joan was at Neil's when Rafe was killed. She saw her through the kitchen window. But we know now that Sherry is a member, secretly. Of the Women's Institute Mafia. I'm ready for a show (laughs) that's just Women's Institute Mafia. 
<laughs> It'd be like that calendar, the we Women's went, Institute calendar, but different and with we guns. We wouldn't want something to happen to your gym now, <laughs> would we? <laughs> You're crazy. And they're back over to Liz's house, but the bailiffs are different now. They're now the most Canadian bailiffs in the world because Barnaby goes, excuse me, lads, can you come back later? And they're like, of course. Well, they probably deal with the police quite a bit. So when they're asked by the police to go, they go. They leave a little too early. And they're also uncredited. (laughs) Ah, well, they take his car. Yep. I don't know. So I understand... Why Sally would go home with Rafe after Melissa died. Yes. I don't understand why Sally turns to Georgina for anything. Because she's coming to the party. Because it's the memorial drinks party. Now we know that not only is Georgina a pucker-faced bitch, she's crazy. Insane. The fact that she didn't cancel this party... When her husband has just died. And calls it the memorial drinks party. But doesn't tell anybody else that. Yes. Right? So people show up thinking that they're going to have a party. The help have to tell them. Until a waiter tells somebody. But these people are all as bad as she is because they're like, oh, we should go. We shouldn't intrude on her. Except, oh, there's Pippa. I need to talk to her. Anyway, la la la. (laughs) They're just... Rotten people. But wait, I have to frame Sally a bit more before I'm done my memorial drinks party. Oh, she's so horrible. So in the most clumsy way ever, she sneaks the syringe into Sally's Sally's bag. bag. I'm surprised Barnaby didn't just go, dude! Like, where was she keeping it? Up her sleeve? I guess. The whole time? Just in case? Memorial drinks party. (laughs) <laughs> is that what you do at memorial drinks parties? You keep syringes up your sleeves just in case you can kill somebody else while you're there? Yep. So Barnaby figures it all out, and we find out that Georgina was driving home. Now, this is a little weak. Georgina's driving home because she liked to drive her 2CV in university, and she wants to drive it again because she's a little tipsy. Mm-hmm. When she's driving the car, she looks like she's in pain. I didn't notice that, Yeah, but okay. Like, she should at least be like, woo! (laughs) Enjoying it. Like, just like the old days. Her husband's brown bread. Mm, (laughs) Brown bread. (laughs) She's so bad. Okay, Melissa's really bad. Georgina's even worse. Georgina's the worst. And then, when everything is revealed, she can't argue against it. She looks at Sally and says, nothing personal. It just sort of snowballed. I killed one person, and then I just had to kill another one, and then I just had to kill my husband. Sorry. So the idea is Barnaby knows that Georgina has put something in the bag, right? So Barnaby comes up with this idea that says, we've already searched her bag, to which Troy and Sally do a good job of not going, "Uh -uh." (laughs) uh-uh. You did? No, you didn't. And he goes over to the bag and opens the bag and touches the evidence. It doesn't matter at this point. They've got her. Though I think if if she, if Georgina, Georgina is so bad that when she gives her explanation, it, it, it just snowballed. If they had said, oh, well, that's okay then. If you didn't want to do it and it just kind of happened, we'll leave you alone now. She would have been like, ew, that's, that's perfect. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Pucker face. Mm-hmm. Please take me out the back. Uh, No. <laughs> I would have marched her in cuffs right through her own party. Excuse me, killer, coming through, arrested, shamed person, coming through. Drunk driver. Drunk driver, coming through, husband killer, coming through. So then we see, at this point in time, Sally's change of demeanor. She is fully corrupt. Yep. She gives Freddie a big old kiss on his bent canines, and she's going to take him down to size. Because rather than learning a lesson... From the things that she's experienced, from the traitorous friends that she had, she's taking inspiration. You know what I took from that whole Freddy scene? Hmm. Freddy has a phone. <laughs> you get obsessed with something. Every episode, there's something that bothers you. The Costin Echo has the following headlines at the Barnabys. Hands off. I don't know what that's <laughs> supposed to be. Maybe it's a description of a murder scene where somebody's hands have been cut off. Because that's the Summit cost and echo. Summit Talks called for. That's another headline. 
On the back is sport, which includes boost for blues. And then, I think, a subtle cry for help from the set dressers. A headline which reads, I've had enough. (laughs) You know who else has had enough? Tom of that jelly, but there's lots more. We should use it for special occasions. (laughs) We don't have to. I have two dozen jars. (laughs) Isn't she supposed to be giving that to the WI or something for like a fundraiser or something? Isn't she supposed to have a daughter? That's my question. Where is Cully? She needs a job or something. For season three, she was all over the place. She'd show up at a drop of a hat. She was in clubs and organizations, and now she's just a homebody making jelly. Best corpse of the episode. Oh, it's got to be Adam. Adam and his rig. Yeah, yeah, it's got to be him. He does a fantastic job. It is a physical thing he does. Yeah. Yeah. It's, It's impressive. And like, okay, so let's just think about this. When you're doing a shot like that, you're probably in that position at least 90 minutes. At the very least. And it might be broken up over time, but that doesn't make it better because you have to get in and out, in and out of that position. Yep. He probably had a situation where they set his head up so he could sit up and maybe drink something, but then they let him down again. Yeah. Please, if there's a picture of this... (laughs) If you were involved, dear listener, in that scene, in any way, behind the scenes. First of all, you want to be on the podcast? We'll put you on the podcast. <laughs> we are desperate for behind the scenes stories of this show. So let's talk about after the credits. Okay. Georgina's in jail. In jaily jail. Hugo and Sherry are left to their jelly making and meddling. Yes. Um, Joan and Clive. Are fine. Yep. Right now, she might do some time for breaking into the vet's office, but I don't think Rafe would press charges. I don't think so. Well, at all. he's dead, so it doesn't matter. Yep. I think they let her off with a warning. I think so. Sally's gonna marry Freddie. Yep. And divorce him. Supposedly divorce him and take all of his money. Gwen gets to be super nosy. Yep. And the Hislops get to be super snobs. And the drinks party continues. <laughs> Yeah, because Sally and Freddie are going to go in and announce their engagement. What an uncomfortable situation of the cops have left and we're all in these people's house. Like, who's the first person to go, yeah, I'm going to leave now. And Freddie and Sally show up, we're engaged. There's a weird tension there, right? So on one hand, you would expect very well-to-do people to have the finest of manners, which means they would leave. Yes. Right? Right. But on the other hand, part of having impeccable manners is never making other people uncomfortable. Yes. Whatever you do. And rolling with any situation, no matter how ludicrous, not making a big deal out of it, you just adapt and you deal. I want to know how long the memorial drink party went on. I think until they were all thoroughly sauced and having a great time because they would have been laughing all night at Georgina. Yep. Because that's the kind of nasty people they are. Is now vet free. Yeah. There's no vet. No horse school. Nope. No vet. Nope. No. And they don't look like they have children. There's no mention no. of any children. No. At all. Gosh, There's no, no children in any of this part of this episode. Georgina would never have children. They would affect her figure, I'm sure. So Liz is left with all of her husband's dads. Yeah. And the but, only person who wants children is Freddie because he says Sally's hips are good for it. No, Liz wants children too. Yeah, but she's not going to have any. Yeah. Poor Liz. She thumbs out the worst in the episode. Because I think she loved Adam. I do, too. In a strange, weird, bizarre, broken way. Yeah, I do, too. But I think she loved Adam. I think she would have been glad to leave the village, change their names, start over, and be broke together. I think she would have been okay with that. Yep. Midsummer Maniacs is on Instagram at at Midsummer Maniacs, and is at Twitter at Midsummer Maniacs, and we're on the Facebook group and the Acorn group. And on the uh, the Reddit group as well. So if you're looking for us, please try to find us. You could look in Jones Hole. Maybe you'll find <laughs> us there. <laughs> Everything else is there. So next week's episode is 05, season 05, episode 2, Market for Murder. Is there any rotten fruit in it? Uh, no, this is the uh, Investing Club episode. Are there any open arses in it? Well, that old lady falls down the stairs and that... Stockbrokers, a bit of an arse. So she kind of goes ass over tea kettle. She does. That maybe counts. Yeah. So. so until then, see you later, maniacs. Bye, maniacs.
was that writer's meeting? I don't know. <laughs> okay, he's radioactive, and he's immortal, and, <coughs> and he worships a lunch. Oh, and a puppet. Because then we don't have to do any kind of special makeup on a kid. Okay, Adam. I, I, I don't think this is a good job for you anymore. <laughs> she spent three years playing three Trolley Molly in that show. playing yep. Trolley Molly. Yeah. And, and Fanshawe worships the food that she makes. Wow. Even though he's radioactive. <laughs> Wait till you see the puppet. You don't even know. <laughs> Wow, it's terrifyingly hideous. I can't wait. It'll be in the show notes. <laughs> but it sure. still has its little private school uniform with stripy tie and everything. Of course it does. <laughs>